Welcome to another edition of the Magpie Circle Show tonight. An almost certain fifth place. Let's not count our chickens or magpies too quickly. Uh, and the playoff campaign to come. Happy with that, everyone? Uh, should we have made the top three? Um, eight wins out of 11 going into our final game at Maidenhead on Saturday. Wonderful crowds all season. Uh, uh, a crowd statistician, Trevor uh, West, will be giving us a bit of a breakdown on what it's all meant over the past few years. But magnificent attendance is just shy of 7,000 this year. Is that down to a return from COVID or goals galore at Meadow Lane? Has Sam Slocum re-established himself as Notts County's number one, number one? All this and more. We're joined by Mark Stallard and Trevor West. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. Good evening. Right. Um, I tell you what, we'll start with Trevor. Oh. Just so Trevor cannot then say, I agree with everything that Stell's just said. Here we go. So, Trevor, we've played all bar one, all bar one. Name of a pub chain, isn't it, that? Um, and we cannot finish higher than fifth. We, technically, we could finish sixth. Um, everyone very happy on Saturday. Feel good factor, lap of appreciation, clean sheet, all of those sorts of things. Um, what's your take on the season as it stands? We all we know that everything is going to be shaped by playoffs, but what's your take on the opening 43 of the 44 games? Um, I think... I... Uh, I'd have liked to have seen us a uh, little bit higher up the table. Um, that said, I was thinking about this earlier, uh, unless you finish top, in a sense, it doesn't matter whether you finish second or seventh, if you ultimately get promoted. And whilst I think that maybe we should have been aiming to finish higher than fifth, um I think that will all be forgiven if we um, if we can do the business uh, in the playoffs. Uh, Stell, what's your take? You've not missed many this season. Um, I agree with Trevor. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's been a decent season without, you know, it's a nearly season, isn't it? I mean, it, we've got more points than we got last season. Um, that the football is... You know the brand, the attacking brand that uh, that the owners wanted, um, and I think you know the entertainment at Merrill Lane has been fantastic this season. The, the return, forty-seven goals scored in the twenty-two uh, league games that they've had, uh, fifty points collected at Meadow Lane. So you know I think it's been value for them, them season ticket holders and people that go regularly. I think it's it's. It's good in that respect that people, you know, at the end of the day, it's a business. You need people to come and pay to get through the, the turnstiles, turn up, create an atmosphere as Knotts fans do. You've got to have a brand of football and a style of football and attacking football that people want to see and want to come back and see. From that perspective, yep, box ticked, absolutely. Um, the slight disappointment is the number of goals conceded, the away form, which, which naturally is always going to be worse than your home. But, you know, most teams pick up more points at home than they do away. It's the nature of football. It's easier usually to play at home than it is away. Um, but, you know, we've just let ourselves down on a few too many occasions. You know, older shot, you know, a couple of, what, a week or so ago, being a case in point. Um, so they're on a fantastic run, eight wins out of the 11 that you mentioned. But they can still slip up, at, as they did at, at, at older shot. So... Um, just a few too many slippers, very close, very close, and hopefully, yet still to provoke, provide some success for us. Um, one of the stats that was produced on uh, well, many stats this year, Trevor. Um, first season since the mid 70s, uh, to score, uh, in every home game. Um, playing devil's advocate that season, 76 77. Believe it or not, we only stayed up by one point. You and I would be, we would have been at Greenwood School, wouldn't we? Would have been at Greenwood mm, School. We would. Yeah, 76, 77, what was I, 15 when that finished? I think slightly older than you, Paul. Not much. <laughs> what, what do you make of that stat? How, how much do you read into it? Um, 
I, 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 I mean, for any team to score in every single home game, you, you've got to, you know, give credit where credit's due. Um, you know, the brand of football, we, we've always said about, you know, it's, it's a very attractive attacking style. Um, and that kind of bears it out. So, you know, he, he's certainly been entertaining. Um, and, uh, yeah, you, you, you want your team to do well at home. Uh, in front of your own supporters, so uh, the the very fact they've done that, they, you know, Medellin is a little bit of a fortress anyway. Um, yeah, c- cannot complain about that at all. You know, it, it it is testament to, you know, to to everyone involved really that they've done that. Um, I guess I'd liken it a little bit, Stel. Tell me if you would think this would be fair or not. It's a little bit like climbing Everest and we've kind of got to base camp. Yeah. Or maybe um, they have like four stages to it, don't they? Uh, we've kind of got to base camp uh, first one, but really the challenge is to get to the summit, isn't it? And how much harder do you think these playoff games will be for the club or not as the case may be compared to getting to fifth in an overall 44 game season um i think i think almost unquestionably the playoffs are harder to win because you're talking about teams that are right up there it's it's win or go home um over a league season as we've seen you can have slip-ups the team that will win the league be it wrexham or stockport have had their slip-ups along the way but they've been the most consistent it's what happens over the season but uh, the playoffs is, <laughs> we're not going to have the lottery debate, but it, the playoffs is hard to win because you are playing against teams that are so finely balanced, so well matched, that over a 44 game season as this is, there's only a few points going to separate six teams. And, you know, on any given day, any one of them teams has a good day, a bad day, it can be all over or there can be a little bit of an upset or whatever it is and you're done it's about three games the team that puts three games together gets promoted and everyone else is left with a disappointment of the season you know promotion is the only aim for them teams at the top and when you get in the playoffs you want to get promoted it's like they say about a cup final isn't it? No, no use going to Wembley and losing you know nobody remembers the losers and nobody remembers the losers in the playoffs so it's all about winning and, and so much of professional sport is and football particularly, but it, it's all about winning. Uh, a few comments just on this theme. I'll try and cherry pick them out. Ian Birchinall, top three should have been the minimum, but let's debate that after playoffs. If we go up, it won't matter. Um, Gary Wardle, Trevor, fourth is the lowest place anyone has been promoted from. Uh, that was Hartlepool. Um, Chris Gosling says, I think all the postponements around Christmas left us falling too far behind to really mount a challenge at the top. We never really had a chance to put pressure on those above us. Uh, uh, There's a lot of presumption about Grimsby, which I'm just, we will obviously debate potential candidates. I'm just a... I'm just a tad nervous at the minute ahead of Grimsby's game with Paul and Wood. We're Grimsby to win that. Um, so, I mean, do you percentageize the fact we're going to finish fifth and play at home to Grimsby? 90%? Yeah, yeah, 90, 98%, whatever you want, 99%. I think, I think we're going to be at home to Grimsby. That's my, my shout. Um, it, it would take a strange set of results it can happen of course it can you know <laughs> technically bore and wood aren't out of it are they if, if results no. go ridiculous they, they but, on the tuesday night you know i think it's going to be at home to grimsby and i don't see anything different but but again it doesn't doesn't really matter as long as not to get that fifth place get a home tie um it doesn't matter who we play against um don't want to count our magpies trevor um were grimsby to win tomorrow which is an if in its in, in its own right. It is conceivable, if not were to lose by a couple, Grimsby win by a couple. Um, 
it is still possible. I, I, are you in the high 90s with Stell? Um, I, I, I'd certainly go along with the, the odds are uh, very good about as I'm uh, being at home to Grimsby. But as you say, uh, even, even though we've got the, uh, the kind of better goal difference, you've only got to look at what happened on Saturday, was it, with Northampton? Did everything they could and still got pipped at the post by Bristol Rovers. So can't take anything for granted. But um, it, I mean, it's in Knott's hands if they get a point away on Sunday, they've guaranteed themselves fifth anyway. So they do still have something to play for there. Plus, they'd want to keep that momentum going, uh, you know, going into the playoffs. Um, momentum, Stel, um, and clearly this may change as a result of the Grimsby result. What team would you put out against Maidenhead? Would you go for your strongest team? Or... Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. It's strongest team, maybe with a couple of exceptions in terms of how much Carl Cameron can play. I'd want some minutes in his legs, but obviously based on, on where he's at. Richard Brindley at play, obviously to get some minutes in his legs. Um, and if there's anybody, I can't think of anybody else off the top of my head that you know, needs minutes that hasn't had them. So I would, yeah, strongest team. Absolutely. Yeah. Trevor. Yeah, definitely. Because you've got, I think is it 10 days yep. after the end of the season or nine days or whatever it is before the, the playoff game anyway. So if you, if you rested a, a, a lot of the, the players who played on Saturday, that would be kind of two and a half weeks without a game for some of them, which, you know, um, no, I'd, I'd, I'm, I'm with Stal. I think I think you go with a, a you know, a, a strongest lineup you can, uh, and definitely as you say, Carl Cameron, Richard Brindley. Uh, I think I'd put them in, even if you you know get sixty minutes out of them. So. No, I mean on the on the subject of selection, Stal. Um, uh, Sam Slocum has come in goal. Stayed as the number one. What, what, what's your view on the goalkeeping situation? I'm not. One person did flag it with me, and I'm not act and I should have checked this out before the podcast tonight. I don't know whether the Czech under 21s would have games round about Nations League, which may or may not affect Yaros's availability. But Sam certainly seems to be getting a lot more game time now than he was a month or so ago. Yeah, and and I'm like you, Paul. I don't know, and I don't know the terms and when the end date of that loan from Liverpool is. Because let's not forget that the sort of playoffs go into June, and and you're right. There's there's national league sort of stuff and international stuff around there. So um, I don't know. I don't know. You know what that means. Whether Yaros is is available or not. Uh, but you're right. Sam Slocum's coming. And and again, the situation hasn't changed. We've got two good goalkeepers there. Two good goalkeepers um, separated minutely by the fact I think that that Vitislav, as a younger goalkeeper is probably more adept with the ball at his feet. Um, but, you know, you, you're talking minute differences. Um, let's just clarify. I'm not sure. It probably was me uh, uh, mentioned Saturday. It is, of course, Sunday at Maidenhead. Uh, and all tickets for that game have been sold. So if you haven't got one, I think you're going to be um, a little bit out of luck. Um, I think another big story this season Um has been attendances uh, uh, just shy of um, 7,000, which I think is a fantastic achievement. Um, there's, there's clearly going to be an element of us not going to be able to have gone the previous season with COVID, entertaining football, scored at home every game. Um, Trevor, I mean, you, have, you, you did a bit of research and you got a few, a few thoughts and views because yeah. probably a decade ago, we were getting less crowds significantly than we were at the end of the season when we got relegated out of the Football League uh, and, and, and and what we're getting in the National League. Right. So, I actually went back 10 years, believe it or not. Um, so, if you, if you want to go back to 10 years, when we actually had our best uh, finish of, of the last decade and we finished seventh in League One, so two divisions higher than we are now, and our average home crowd then was 6,808. So it's kind of comparable with where we are now. Uh, and then they steadily declined as our form declined and we dropped from League 1 into League 2. Um, 
dropped down as low as just over 4,800 uh, five or six years ago. Um, but then it's been on, it's it's kind of steadily risen or, or kind of maintained uh, the level since then. So, you know, we were just done a look. Um, I think Alan when Alan Harley took over, we actually finished the season with just under 6,000. But it was telling, actually, that prior to him coming, um, we had a lot of attendances which were sub-4,000. That was kind of the norm. Um, and I think we only had one sub-4,000 attendance um, after Alan Hardy took over. So I'll give him a little bit of credit there, which may be a little bit controversial. But anyway, um, I, I do think he um, tried to do his bit in, in terms of putting knots on the map. Um, and uh, since then, um, looking at that uh, following season when we finished fifth, got just under 8,000. Um, season we got relegated 7 3. Um, so obviously, for us to be getting kind of 6 8 or whatever it is this season, partially I think it's because uh, there is a genuine desire to see knots, and, um, and I think the football that's been played people actually enjoy watching obviously we've been reasonably successful in terms of we've we've kind of been in or around the playoffs all season um and possibly as you say because we were all starved of live football because of covid um i suspect that's also had a, a bearing on people coming to uh, you know uh, uh back to middle lane but uh, yeah yeah Crowds have the, the sheer size of them. Am I, am I surprised at them, did you yeah. say? Sorry. Yeah, are you surprised yeah. the crowds have held up so well and, and improved this season? Um, no, not really. No, I, I, I think that there is the fan base there, I think. And, and Trevor's exactly right. You know, there was a lot of effort, you know, during the Alan Hardy years and, you know, to market the club and get people through the gates with all different manner of promotions and things going on, you know, are off the pitch, if you like, to try and generate that that sort of interest, and we, you know, we filled the ground a couple of times, didn't we? Uh, on the was it Quidditch kid games and and things like that. Um, so so the the fan base is there, and this is what not for thirty years probably in, in multiple ownerships know that there isn't a potential fan base there if you can get it right on the pitch. The problem has been getting it right on the pitch. Um, so I think, you know, the, the owners have made, you know, it clear how they want to play football. They want it to be attractive to watch. It is, it is entertainment after all. Of course, fans want success. We all want success. We all want to get up the divisions. Um, but I think they've made a good start in terms of the football. If the product is good, people will return. You know, people will pay the hard-earned money because it ain't cheap. You know, but, you know, it's football, I would say, is on a par with pretty much anything else in life, but, you know, entertainment wise. Um, but if you're going to watch something that, you know, look at the stats this year, goal every game, winning the majority of games, you know, 50 goals scored, uh, sorry, 50 points. You know, the stats that we've gone through, you would go and pay to watch. If you're a football fan and Nottingham, Notts County fan and, and, and in the Nottingham area, you would go and watch that. Now, the... The difficulty in sport and in football particularly is maintaining that over a longer period because, as Trevor mentioned there, once the success doesn't come or it drifts away, then people lose interest and people don't come back. So so the difficulty and the challenge is to keep it exciting, keep it interesting, keep it winning to make sure that, that people want to come back. Yeah, I mean, I, I, th I think I think attendances have been um, remarkably good, and I think picking picking up on Trevor's point, given I think the way Alan blotted his copybook relegation and then got himself into a world of hurt on kind of every single front, and conducted him himself in a way which I think clearly upset the overwhelming majority of our fan base. Um, you'll never necessarily get the credit that I think perhaps he is entitled to in, in kind of reinventing the club a little bit uh, in the sense that 
that Ray Drew, who had saved the club, but I think had become increasingly disenchanted and disenfranchised with it and got fed up with it. Uh, and it become and it became um, a burden for him almost uh, because, as you said, Trevor, crowds. You know, you would there were there were, there were mid games where it was the, the, the crowd began with the three. Yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. And and not just the odd one. They were, I, I had a look at the, I had a look at that season. So you know, from from pre the pre Hardy era to to the post Hardy era that season, and it was noticeable. Um, Yes, yeah, so I think we only had, I think we only had one sub four thousand crowd after Alan Hardy came out, and I've got a feeling that was a midweek game against Exeter, so they clearly wouldn't have bought many. But prior to that, um, I don't know where that run of the the kind of ten uh, defeats on the bounce, but even at the beginning of the season, uh, the majority of those games, or quite a number of those games, as you say, began with a three. Which is on, you know, you look, you look at what we get now, and that would be unheard of. Yeah, and, and I think also the club have done very well with um, attracting young people, uh, mm -hmm. promotions, offers. I think the family stand, they have the, the, the sensory perception room. Um, they do a lot of initiatives to get very young people in. Uh, and, and I think one of the, say, um, one of the assets Knots have with the 20,000 stadium and only, say only, 7,000 being in it, is that there's 13,000 spare seats. So when you are very young and you're four, five, six, seven, eight, you don't necessarily want to sit in one seat, which if you are operating at full capacity, you haven't got a choice. And it can be quite intimidating for people of that age. So I think Knots have got an asset that I think they use very well for, for very young people to have the space to move around, um, to have lots of the um, face painting, kids games, those sorts of things. Um, which, which I think is very good, and, and, and that's absolutely the way to go. Um, I guess my thoughts, like yours, Stell, would be I think there is a window for us in the National League where we can retain this level, where we can retain this level before it starts to just kind of tip the other way, tip the other way. Um, and, we'll, and we'll get a few thoughts, I'll, I'll, re I'll read some out in a minute. Um, one thought, gazing into your crystal ball, Stel, every season to go up is the most important. Um, but there are additional kind of um, uh, potential challenges for us with the current squad. Aren't there? You, know, you have your leading scorer for each of the three seasons so far who is out of contract. And he would clearly not be short of offers, depending which way he wants to move his career, you would imagine. Um, and you have two of probably your most valuable players, Ruben Rodriguez and Kel Roberts, both going in to the final year of their contracts. And as a club, you've got a decision to make there. Do you want to offer them a new contract? Do you want to run that contract down and allow them to play for another season and lose your value, potentially? Um, or do you have an adult conversation with the agents and say, look, if we get an offer of X, go and get, go, go, go and get your player a club and we'll, we'll let him go for that. I mean, what, what's your take on kind of where knots are? Yeah, well, that's... that's comes with the territory that that sort of thing what you've been discussing there we've, we've seen it sort of in the well, i say the rear view mirror it's been front and center almost for for six months now certainly with kyle uh, wooten coming out of contract um i think you know i, I make, make no secret i think i think kyle will be on his way i don't think he'll be here next year um you're right he'll be he'll have plenty of offers um and you know plenty of offers where he can go and earn lots more money and play it play in the football league in, in higher divisions um so i would be amazed if he was still here next season but you know never say never i don't know anything i've got no inside information on that just you know that i know not it would have if they could have tied him down to a contract well before now um so i think that sort of speaks of the fact that 
his agent has made it clear that that he's not going to extend his deal while not so in this division, um, and you know not going to pay him what what he wants, sort of thing. So uh, I think that is that would be no shock to anybody. I don't think if if Kyle goes at the end of the season, Ruben and Cal again two prize assets will have a marketable value, and anybody at any level has got a value. Anybody can be bought. Anybody has got a price that they will be sold at. Um, so I think it's it almost goes without saying that I think if somebody comes in with the right sort of money, then I imagine the owners will seriously consider any bids. You know, not, not any bids, but consider all above an acceptable sort of level and see, because you always like to think that club are doing their, their, their homework in the background with, with the sports radar, the football radar company. They will back themselves to be able to replace any player because you just never know. It, it may not be a transfer. It may be a long-term injury. You know, you've got to have replacements. You've got to have the next cab on the rank, if you like. You just don't know what's around the corner in football. So plans should always be in place for what we're going to call worst-case scenario, but should always be in place for... What if, what if, and I'm, I'm going to say it now, but Ruben or Cal refuse to play anymore because they don't want to get injured because they've got a, a mega move lined up and not suggesting that they would do that, but it can happen in football. So what's your plan? Don't get caught with your trousers down as a club that, oh, we didn't see any, any of that coming. I'm sure they do. And I'm sure the amount of research and the amount of stats and, and, information that they've got to hand all the time will mean that yeah if, if if a deal comes in that we think we can replace with better because again there's no evidence to show that they are selling owners no evidence whatsoever I totally agree with that yes. so but that doesn't mean to say that they see value in every player and if somebody comes in and offers you a, a silly amount for a player and you think you can replace with better with the money that you're getting, well, it's a no-brainer. That's that's trade. That is trade in a market. And that is what happens, whether it's football or anything. So, yeah, I mean, it's an in, it will be an interesting situation. And, and I, I, again, I wouldn't be overly surprised with football how it is that, that two out of them three are maybe not here next season. Trevor? Yeah, it's difficult to argue with any of that. I just, I, I, I wonder whether um, Kyle would consider staying if we got promoted. Um, you know, uh, because yeah, he may well get offers from from perhaps League One clubs, but that's going to be quite a it's going to be quite a leap from where he is at the moment, and and there'll be expectations on him there. Um, he's at the club that clearly wants him. He, he, he seems to enjoy playing for knots, and I just wonder if uh, whether he would be inclined to stay if we got promoted. You know, whether he'd, whether he, I don't know, whether he'd be inclined to sign maybe a one-year extension or or something like that. I don't know. I mean, I had a good chat with Kyle last week. Uh, at the sponsor's lunch. Uh, lovely lad, by the way. Really is. And, and as to be fair, are all the players that you mentioned before, Stel. Good spirit, um, good communicators, good ambassadors. Um, all speak very well. Take the time out to, to meet and greet with uh, fans, followers, supporters, which they did on, on, on Saturday. Um, and I was talking to Carl, and um, you know, we were talking about how he's been the top scorer for three seasons on the chop. And you would appreciate this now. Uh, he's playing as a lone striker for the vast majority of games. It's one person up top. Yeah. So he's putting a shift in. He's back for all the set pieces. Yeah. Because when we bring the 11 back uh, and top scorer hitting nearly 20, 20 a season. So he's clearly ticking a lot of boxes. And that, that is not a that is not an easy thing to do. Uh, and, and he said to me, um, how are you enjoying it to me? And I says, well, I said, it's hard for me because I thought about it, tried to give him a proper answer. I said, it's hard to me because every game I see in the National League, 
is difficult because fundamentally I, I I associate Notts County as a football league club throughout, you know, not just the football league club, but as a club that's had stints uh, in the top division of English football, you know, from the age of like about seven through no, uh, no longer, from the age of about 10 through to about 25, they were never outside the top two divisions. So I said, I find it quite hard. Uh, and I said, and I, and I equate it to Sunderland being in League One, the third tier. I said, it, it don't matter what Sunderland do. Their fans will judge their season on getting promoted because they feel they are playing in a standard of football that is beneath where they should be. Fan base, recent history, crowds, all the rest of it. And, and Carl said, yes, a very good analogy. It's a good analogy. I said, and so I, I kind of get frustrated at times because I want, you know, I, I think, you know, for me, fifth isn't where we should be. He said, no, I get that. I get that. And he says, the times I've I've gone into the dressing room after games, he said, and I've you know I've I've you know I've gone quite loud and called a few people out. He's the vice captain, um, and he says he says I'm massively up for these playoffs. He says we all are. Uh, he says we know we know what's at stake. And I said to him, I said when you look up and down the walls of the club and you'll see all the bit you know team photos, carpe diem, all of that sort of stuff. Uh, I said, and you'll see teams in the top flight and all that. I said, yeah, I said, we can never compete with that. I says, well, you can, because you get promoted. You'll all be heroes. You will be a group of players that's taken this football club out of, out of you know, over there, the land we should never be in, and brought us back into the football league. And he says, oh, really? You think so? I said, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and... Um, it's interesting, still, that both you and Lee Curtis think he's definitely off. Yeah, unless we unless we go up. I don't think it's a one hundred percent shoeing. I don't think it's he 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 he, he, he settled in the area, um, got his own place uh, with his partner, uh, and I I think he kind of and I, it, it would have been un, it would be unfair of me to ask him, you know, no. Not, I think he wants to stay. I think he wants to stay. But there's that a football career is a very short one. There is a massive difference between National League, certainly in League One, yeah, if there was any interest from there. I, I still think there is a chance he will stay. And, and, and I may go so far as to say, I think if we go up, hesitate to say definitely, but I think there's a pretty strong chance he would then stay. I hope you're right. <laughs> <laughs> so do I. <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm saying that with no knowledge, no, you know, I'm just looking at it, trying to be impartial, you know, trying to be, you know, as, as realistic as possible. And, you know, I, I the only the only way I can see him staying is, is with promotion. I mean, that that is the only way. And even then, I think it would be, an outside, outside chance. Knotts would have to boost his wages, you know, just just to compete with what will be offered to him elsewhere. Um, I, I, I'd love to see him stay. I'd love to see all three of them stay. I, I you know, I, all Knotts fans would. You know, it's it's it goes almost without saying that that we're not looking to and, and wanting to get rid of our better players and our best players. Um, but I'm saying the realities of the situation seem to point to he will have, as well as maybe Ruben and Cal, will have offers from within the Football League that will severely test what you really want out of the game and what you really want out of your career. And again, I'd be... I want him to stay. I, you know, <laughs> I want him to stay because we want to see the best players. We want the best chance to get up the leagues and play at better grounds and, and commentate at better grounds and watch at better grounds. But again, it comes back to that. We all want to be at better grounds. And Kyle Wotton and Ruben Rodriguez and Cal and anybody in that Notts team will have the same ambition to play in better grounds in front of bigger, bigger order, audiences, attendances, um, in the big games, we talk. You talk about Sunderland there in League One. You know them and Sheffield Wednesday playing tonight. Going to set the record. Going to smash the record. Yeah. I would imagine for the yeah. combined aggregate attendance in the League One playoffs. You know there are big clubs in League One. 
big, big clubs in League One, big attendances. And that is a pull to anybody. As much as you, 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 you know, Carl Wooten might be settled in the area if it's him we're talking about, that is a hell of a decision he's going to have to make to go, and I'm not saying Sunderland are in for him, but I'm saying somebody in League One who's maybe prepared to double, maybe treble his wages, for him to say, no, I'm going to stay in non-league football with not because I'm settled. I mean, that he, he, he deserves a statue if he does that. <laughs> but... <laughs> But you know that that's the reality of the situation. That that is the the and again with every footballer, as, as Trevor said, you know he might stay for a one year extension. No agent in the world would get him to sign a one year extension because if he breaks his leg on the first game of next season, mm -hmm. his stocks, yeah, so, sort of gone. So uh, you know, trying to find the best case scenario for Knox is promotion. The owners up the budget, and and we, you know, we stay. But but again, it's yeah, I can't see it. If you know, if I was betting on it, I'm afraid I, I would say he'll be elsewhere. But I hope I'm wrong. I've been wrong plenty of times before. Trevor, that and it's, it's a good point you just made, Stel, about the kind of one year extension because, as you say, anything happens and his career finishes at that point. Yeah. Um, as I said, I, I, for me, it all hinges on whether or not to go up. Uh, I think if if we don't, I cannot see him staying because he'll have, he'll have too many offers. Um, if we go up and if the owners say, you know, we're going to have a competitive budget for next season, because to be honest, you know, we would get crowns in League Two um, on a par with any other team in there, I, I would think. You know, uh, we'd certainly be one of the best supported um, clubs. Um, we've got the resources. If he's settled in the area, um, and if it looks as though Knotts could, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but if Knotts were to get promoted this season, you would like to think that they would be competitive next season as well. Um, you've only got to look at, at, you know, what previously promoted teams have, have done. Sutton have just missed out on a playoff spot this year. Um, you know, so you would like to think that if Notts can get up this season, they've, you know, they could keep it going and, and have a successful season next year. Um, not necessarily saying they would get promoted again, but, um, you, you know, I don't think they would want to settle for, for mid-table obscurity. I think they would actually want to, you know, they'd say, you know, we've got, we've actually got the nucleus of a really good squad here with players who would not look out of place in, in League Two. And with a, with a couple of decent additions, um, we, you know, we could have a, we, we could make a real fist of it. So, yeah, uh, but as I say, I, I uh, unless we go up, I can't see him staying. But if we do, I would like to think that, you know, I think you need what you were saying earlier, Paul, about, you know, you, you kind of got the impression he, he, he likes being at Knotts and he's settled and all the rest of it. Perhaps actually what he needs is a reason to stay and maybe promotion would be that reason, you know. Very good. A little bit more bre uh, levity. Chris Jordan, I wish they'd introduce face painting in the Pavis for the Grown Ups too. Unfair. Uh, <laughs> David Skinner, uh, average of 34,659 in 1950 is the highest average season attendance ever between us and that lot across the river. I'm guessing that will be a legacy of Tommy Lawton, who came in the late 40s, which was to our younger generation is the equivalent of us quite literally, quite literally of Notts County signing Harry Kane as he was England's number nine at the time. Uh, 20,000 quid record British transfer fee. How times have changed. Um, what else have we got here? Uh, David also had to run the fourth division in 1971 with an average gate of 10,757. Um, do, 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 do. what else? What else? Um, do, 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 do. 
Pythagoras agrees with you, Stel. That's what Brentford have done. Sold with replacement players already identified. Um, uh, Bootlegger1864. Hi, lads. Hoping us, Wrexham and Notts go up this season. Two great clubs with great stadiums. Well, for that to happen, Bootlegger, uh, obviously you're going to have to pick Stockport. Now, so you you've obviously written uh, uh, written Wrexham off, God knows how many times, yep. uh, over <laughs> many weeks. Um, they're not going to blow it, are they, Stockport? No, well, I've got I've got to stick to it now, and I've, I've, I've said they've, they've walked it how many times? So, so I might get that wrong. I might get Carl Wooden wrong. Carl Wooden might be signing a four year deal in the next week. Who knows? I'll get them both wrong. Um, but I mean, yeah, it would be an incredible. Uh, slip away, but Wrexham, you know, battered them, didn't they? Really, at the weekend, um, two say, oh, say two good teams, two two good clubs in terms of history, football league in terms of, of Wrexham and, and not Stockport as well. Got plenty of football league history, so it's tight and it's amazing. The end of the season when things get tight, when things just get the you know, winning line comes in sight, funny things happen. Now you could flip that on its head. And as Knox fans, we're sat here as Knox fans with Knox interest at heart. Who would you rather be in the playoffs that we might have to play? Stockport or Wrexham? So, you know, who do we want to go up because we don't have to play them in the playoffs? Tough, tough call because if you saw the Stockport game a few, well, what, two months ago, whenever it was, six weeks ago, when Knox had all the illness and injury, we, we, we were absolutely battered. Yet against Wrexham, we've won and drawn against them this season. So, but we beat Stockport comfortably before Challenger uh, took over at our place. So, from a from a selfish perspective, who would we rather play in the playoffs? And I dare say, at this moment in time, despite having beat them and drawn with Wrexham, they're the team with momentum. They're the team yes. scoring goals. They can go and get promoted, and we'll play Stockport who are stuttering. What I do take as a positive when we're looking into the art of football in psychology, Trevor is that both Wrexham and Stockport right now at this moment think they can get automatic one of them is going to be disappointed and I think sometimes when you are that close to something and it gets taken away can be difficult you know if if, if Stockport had won the league a week ago Wrexham mentally prepare. As it is, I think it's great that those two are going head to head because there is, you know, if you're Wrexham now, clearly a lot, you know, much is going to be governed on Wednesday. But even if Stockport win that, I think I'm correct. Um, Wrexham have got a better goal difference. So I think it's got to go, hasn't it? Trevor, you're the man or yeah, it's got to go to the last day of the season. I am going from memory, but if Wrexham win the last game, I think Stockport need four points. Yes, if they so win, they've got, to, they've got to win and draw. If they win, even if they win Wednesday, yeah, I still, I still think they need a result because you would assume Wrexham will Sunday. will win the last game. Yeah, so yeah, I think um, yeah. So there's, there's there's still pressure on. Um, in a sense, there's there's possibly slightly less pressure on Wrexham because it's not in their hands. Um, but I would expect them to go all out and, and win the last game comfortably. Um, so it does it does put a little bit of pressure on Stockport because they've they've kind of you know they've been well clear for for a while now, and but they still need results in their last two games, or potentially will still need results in the last two games. Um, and I and I think you know if it came to it and we got through our eliminator or quarter final or whatever you want to call it. Of the two, I'd, I'd prefer us to play Stockport than Wrexham. And I know we got battered a few weeks ago, but we're not the same team then. And no, actually, nor are Stockport, you know. Um, you know, uh, so I, I would, I'm loath to say I fancy our chances more against Stockport, but I think of the two, they're the team that I'd rather play in the semi finals. Um, now, I, I meant to read this out earlier. Cyprus Ref, uh, who is a, pretty much a compendium of all things, um, said Czech under-21s play England under-21s Friday the 3rd of June. So unlikely to play 
as in playoff final, which is Sunday, June the 5th, if we qualify. So I wonder if that, and you know, I'm sure the club will address this at some point, Dale, but that that would make sense, wouldn't it, in terms of, uh, on the basis, you would think it would be called up at least a week before, that maybe the manager is now going to go with uh, Sam because it gets him match fit, match ready, part of the regular defence for a playoff assault. Yeah, yeah, possibly. I mean, with the under twenty ones, I don't know what the the call up structure is, and yeah. you know they, they generally can be quite flexible, can't they? If they've got games to play, but again, it, it'd be on an individual case, wouldn't it? But it, but it do, it does make sense because let's say you know even if he's called up, he could get injured on that call. He could get injured in that game, yeah. which is potentially two days before uh, what's it the playoff final. Yes, um, and and you want to be left with a goalkeeper that's not played for for eight weeks, do you? So I think it, it makes sense for Sam to come in and get some game time with an eye towards you just not don't know what's around the corner. Um, and just to tidy up the result, uh, the, the fixtures-wise, so Stockport home to Halifax and Torquay. That's their last two games. Yeah. Um, Wrexham are away to Dagenham, who, of course, can still get in. So that will be um, a, a decent game uh, in East London. Um, it certainly still. Um, I don't think you could have anticipated that the destiny of the automatic place would be going to the final weekend of the season, would you? No, not a month ago. Not a month ago when they were, what, about 10, 12 points clear? Was it something like that? They looked like they got it. Home and hose, they were on an unbelievable run, weren't they? Stockport. Um, but again, this is this is football that no matter how good these teams are, and no matter how big the budgets are, it's all levels. Levels you hear levels spoken about all the time in professional sport, and they are still a national league team and national league players and national league clubs. Yes, they might have been brought down from a couple of divisions higher, but we're not talking about Ronaldo and Messi dropping down, we're talking about lower league players going and playing in the National League. So the difference between them on any given day, because of that lack of consistency factor, you know, anything can happen. And when teams start getting a little bit twitchy and a little bit nervous, and like I say, when the finish line comes in sight and you're actually going to achieve something or potentially, then it can get a little bit a little bit hairy. And and you know that's that's where mentality comes into it as well as quality. And and yeah, I mean it's, it's it makes for an interesting Top two, not that unfortunately we're not fighting it out. We're not one of the teams there, but it could have an impact on us because, again, I, I, I assume people are aware that fifth, if not finished fifth, fifth v six plays second in the semi final. So we will be playing Stockport or Wrexham yeah. come the, the, the semi final. So we'll have to go to one of them two places. You know, assuming we get fifth, you know, it would be like I say, it's all but done. But uh, yeah, we will be playing second place in the semi final. So uh, that is going to be a massive game. Um, OK, um, statistics. We all know we produce a lot of them. Uh, and I just and, 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 and this is just meant as levity. Please don't read too much into it. I know our people can get too serious at times. So um, you like this, Stel. So there is um, a points per minute formula. Points per minute. minute for players. <laughs> okay. So depending how many minutes, I think, depending how many minutes you are on the pitch and whether right. you are winning or not, can from that, there is a formula, a point per minute. Rating, right? Are you with me so far? <laughs> Just about, yeah. <laughs> okay, so the maximum, yeah. if I've got this right, and I, and I may not have. Right. Um, so the maximum points per minute rating for a player. Trevor, I've got a level of maths and stats. Trevor, you're you're a bright boy at Forest Field. <laughs> What's the maximum points per minute number you can have? Maximum points per minute. You're talking about like three points divided by 90 minutes or something. Well, apparently, it's three. 
Okay, i.e., every minute you are playing, right? Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. Ah, right. Every minute you are yeah. playing and you're winning, it's three. So that's the maximum. So it, it, when they're holding the cards up in strictly, you know, 10, 10, <laughs> 10, 10, right? Three is the maximum. Okay. So as you, and uh, we can all play along with this at home, uh, right? So points per minute formula for Notts County players. Okay, no cheating and going online, all right? So, I've got the top six, right? In reverse order, okay? Firstly, both of you, who do you think is going to come out top? Points per minute formula. Do you know, I'm going to go really left field here. No. <sighs> I could be massively wrong. I'm going to go really left field, and I and I haven't looked. I am going to actually say Ed Francis. Well, well, that's not bad because you have got someone who is in the top six. Okay. Oh, well, yeah, hey, Stell. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm I'm tied in not for this, Paul. I've got to be honest. I thought you were, it was a magic trick, and you were going to tell me my pin number at the end of all that. <laughs> Um, so oh, we do that. Right. So just just name name a player. Well, going on the fact that they said um, there was a stat one that when when Carl Cameron played, we we won, and when he didn't play, we didn't win. So I'll go Carl Cameron. He doesn't figure in the top. <laughs> there, there you go. go. You, come on, Joseph. Tell it. Tell him the pin number. On, what, what's that thing when they go with the X? Uh, 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 oh, yeah. uh, for you, Stell. Right. Okay. Duncan Comrie has gone Slocum. Pythagoras has gone Eli Sam. Cypress Ref has gone Kyle Cameron. Uh -uh. Eli Sam. Uh -uh. Right. OK. In sixth place, I thought you'd like this, with a points per minute formula. And I know some of the lads watch it as well, and, and they, they will be wetting themselves as well. <laughs> right. Because <laughs> uh, I doubt they know it either. I doubt they know it. So, in sixth is Sam Slocum. With a points per minute formula of 2.01. There you go. In fifth place. <laughs> in fifth place. Jim O'Brien. 2.04. Uh, in fourth place. Trevor. Spotter's badge. Ed Francis. 2.09. Few more guesses coming in. Paul Huskisson, Matty Palmer, ah uh, ah, uh, Lee Atkins, Wooten, ah uh, ah. Uh. Right. Third. <laughs> Look at Stell. Yeah, we're just there. What? Is it? what? Um, I just made this I, up. I don't Honestly, know where this is headed, though, no, Paul. This, that, is, that's this is a formula that well, people extrapolate. Okay. The and tension's unbearable. Brady well. takes into the manager and says, I've got the top points per minute formula <laughs> of any player at this club and wow. I want a new contract. Right? Um, okay. So, in third, <laughs> Harry Arter, 2.11. <laughs> okay. David Skinner goes DKE. Uh, uh, and you're all thinking, who on earth is left? Second runner up, Sam Graham, 2.25. <laughs> Lee Atkins, Jackson. So it's basically players that haven't played much then by the, by the sound of this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I tell you, we've probably had 35 players playing this season. You could name 42 of them and you still wouldn't get it right. Um, right. <laughs> the winner. The highest points per minute formula for Notts County in the first team this season with a formularic number or rating, whatever you want to call it, of 2.33 is Connor Parsons. <laughs> it might as well have been, oh, what? It might as well have been Connor McGregor. <laughs> what use is that? <laughs> <laughs> and not, honestly, I'm not being disrespectful to anybody. I'm just saying mm -hmm. how when we can play statistical games, you can manipulate <laughs> things. And so I, I'm guessing, right, I'm guessing that when Connor Parsons played, right, 
maybe he came on as sub a lot when we were winning. Mm. Yeah? Because if you start the game, it's a draw, isn't it? Yeah? I think, I think. So, basically, that formula of minutes played to the points we're getting, Connor Parsons is top. 2.33. So, I'll send that to Connor Parsons' agent, okay? And I'm sure he can make hay with that one. Well, well, that's five minutes of my life I'm not getting back. I was say, yeah, we found a new <laughs> although, stat. Although you've got a pointless stat award. <laughs> yeah, we just had it. Although I didn't quite enjoy the tension. <laughs> <laughs> I thought my stats were useless, but honestly. <laughs> I don't know how yeah, to follow you, that. You couldn't <laughs> make that up, could you? What, what was your stuff when thinking, you were playing? I could. I don't believe me, Paul, I could make that up. It sounds like somebody has. You may as well have done. <laughs> but can, you, can you imagine, Stel, if you were a player, right, and you had a bad year, and someone came in and told you that, you'd be going to the manager, hey, come on, Gaffer, I've not been that bad. My points per minute formula is the Paul, best in the, in the, in the, the era I played, I can only imagine the response I'd get from some of the managers if I went in armed with that, having played two and a half games all season, going, hey, I need a new contract because we've won points when I've been on the pitch. I could only imagine what the, the manager would then say. Yeah. But, uh, oh, yeah. Oh, I, 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 well, I tell you what, I'll get a good night's sleep tonight knowing that. <laughs> I mean, I know, I know, I know. We, we, I'm, genuinely, I'm not being disrespectful to stats, okay? But sometimes I think the world can go a little bit mad. You know what I mean? A little bit mad. And right, I'm, I'm going to bring this up. I wasn't going to, uh, because at least Tom Stevens has shown a sense of humour. Um, you may have seen me being accused of being a bully tonight and all sorts of things, and Tom asking about. Three times, retraction, retraction, retraction. Um, Tom is, uh, shall we say, an active Twitter follower of Notts County with some sometimes quite strong uh, extreme views. In the intro last week, uh, I, as you know, I have a fan club at Notts County Mad, so I'll give him a bit. And I also mentioned Tom and used the word troll, which apparently to the Twitterati is, you know, equivalent of, you know, if I murdered them, it wouldn't be deemed as bad. So Tom has taken this to heart. I asked him on the show so we could discuss social media. I genuinely am interested in how people spend a large part, portion of their lives on social media, baiting, you know, they may call it banter. And Tom said, uh, I'm not ever coming on your show. I'm far too busy. I'm going to sue you. I'm going to do this, blah, 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 blah. Now, it would appear, because Tom guards his anonymity on social media, don't you, Tom, uh, that his name is Tom Stevens because uh, Tom is on our message boards. So, Tom, I am quite happy as we've just qualified for uh, the playoffs to let bygones be bygones if you are, right? I'm sure you would not accuse me of being a bully any more than I would accuse you of being a troll in the sense that you understand the word. That's as good, that's as good as you are going to get, my friend. And anybody else out on social media, because I seem to have upset some of the Knox County Twitterati, the offer is open to any of you to come on here and discuss how you portray extreme views, often anonymously, okay? Ian Birchinal, and this applies to both sides of the debate, and I want some thoughts from you, Trevor. Um, Ian Birchinal's come off social media this year after getting pelters, right? I don't think there's a place for any manager at all in football, even in semi-pro football, to be on social media. I think it diverts from the pressure and all the rest of it, okay? Um, I spoke with the players. This is a genuine debate. I spoke with the players uh, uh, last week about social media. And most of them now say, well, look, it, it, it is really difficult for us. And we kind of just treat it in a, I guess, an anodyne way because they can't engage with people because of extreme views that now come in. And, and, and I am sure... A lot of people suffer mental health issues because of extreme views that come into their Twitter accounts and all the rest of it. Um, if I'm right in thinking, 
Trevor, you, you, you came off Facebook for a little while, didn't you, and said mm -hmm. it was, and if you don't mind me asking you, no, um, no, no, and it was kind of taking over too much of your life. And, mm -hmm. and I think if you are a professional sportsman now, you kind of got to make one or two decisions. Yeah. There's been a big story broke today about the Norwich player, Brandon Williams, the Manchester United player on loan at Norwich, how he was followed by Norwich fans. I think I'm right in saying, and I don't want to go uh, into too much detail, but I think there was a big to do on Twitter. And I'm sure Tom Stevens, who's still on the show now, can tell us more about it because I'm sure he would know about it. Zach Brunt's dad got engaged on social media and there was a huge amount of vitriolic abuse that got waded in um give me your because i don't go on social media a lot why do you come on facebook Trevor? i mean how, how dangerous or how all-consuming can social media be normally this is a younger age group which rules me out which rules stell out uh and which would normally rule you out but clearly you've had some of your own challenges with it so i'm older than the pair of you i think I'm sad, I? but it was uh, um no I, 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 just for, for me personally i think it was so easy just to go on there you've got your app on your phone it's literally one thumbprint on the app and, you, you know, you get up in the morning, you'd have your breakfast, you get ready or whatever. You think, I'll just have a quick look at Facebook. And, and an hour later, you think, Hang on, where, where's the time gone? And, and what have I actually achieved in that time? And I made a conscious decision to come off it um, a few months ago, thinking that I would probably miss it. So I deactivated my account just to make it harder for me to go back on there. And actually, I found I didn't, I didn't miss it at all, um, or very, very little. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm currently not on there, and I, I don't miss it. I'll, I'll go back on it at some point, but um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I don't spend a lot of time these days on it anyway. Uh, even, even when I am active on there. Um, you know, because if if you're not careful, you can get embroiled in all sorts of stuff. So I'm I'm very careful about what I post on there. Um, try and avoid any kind of conflict or anything like that. But but actually, a, a lot of what's on there, I, I don't find of any of interest anymore. Um, I've still got my Twitter account, and I will occasionally go on there, and I'll occasionally post something. But even on that, I'm I'm not on there an awful lot. Um, so God only knows what it's like if you're a footballer, and, and as you say, if you were a manager of a club, because I think I think Ian Birchnell was actually quite active on Twitter when he was managing in um Scandinavia, but I, I think he must have come off it pretty much straight away when he came to Knots. Um, I don't know why any manager of any club would do that at any level. Because I think just asking for trouble, um, uh, and yeah, so it must be it must be particularly difficult if you are in the public eye. So if if you are um, if you are a player, particularly, you know, if, if you're playing in the Premier League or whatever, um, yeah, you're just asking for abuse, really. Um, I suspect most players at that level probably don't manage their own social media accounts anyway. Mm -hmm. They probably probably have their agents or the people to uh, to do it for them so how actively or how much notice to take of it i don't know uh but i did see the post that you're referring to from zach Bronstad. um i don't really want to get involved in that but i don't think it's done the lad any favors and if if his dad had got a problem with the club um maybe he should have left it till the end of the season just my take on it. Um, I don't think it's done Zach any good whatsoever, you know, because um, it, it it will ultimately have the fans turning against him if he's not careful. So. Um, Lee Atkins, unfortunately, any opinion on social media gets shot down all the time. 
David Skinner, Mark Lawrence and said on Football Focus, Twitter is for clowns and for those who have too much time on their hands. Joe Johnson, people are too easily offended nowadays. Gary Wardle, just the woke society um, that we live in. Uh, who, Gary also uh, adds, so David Skinner, Mark, no, hang on, I'm getting confused. Uh, woke society, blah. Uh, Ian Birchnell, uh, what I like about this show is there are different views, but it's never been personal or nasty. That's how it should be. I have my opinions on topics, but doesn't make it right. Uh, Gary Wardle, Tom, just because others disagree with your view, they get more abuse, but they ignore the clappers. Um, I think it is a younger person, and I suspect Tom is younger, right? Uh, and I hope these things are put together. Uh, put to bed finally, John, because I don't think it's very good for you being at the epicentre of all sorts of Twitter spats either. Um, you know, we should be working together for Notts County. Um, still, um, if you were 20 years younger, do you think you'd be on social media or do you kind of not get it? I mean, I, I know you have a Twitter account and you use it very sparingly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that, sparingly is one word. When I can work out what I need to do or how you do it, I mean. But I'll be honest with you. I mean, I, I'm a I'm a tech nightmare. I like to say, as you well know. But um, no, the answer is no. I, I certainly wouldn't be on it if I was 20 years younger. But I can understand why people do it, and I understand why people. Some people enjoy it, and you know, it's some things are good. Um, but for me, I just I, I think people sometimes look too in depth at it. For me, you have to treat it like a TV channel, you know, or the, you know, the, what's the gambling thing that's everywhere now? When the fun stops, stop. Just switch it off. If you don't like what you're seeing or reading or hearing, come off it. Switch it off. Put your phone down. I know people are addicted to it, and unfortunately, you know, like I say, it affects people's mental health, and that's a serious mm. problem in the world. Um, but the to me, I, it's you know just just put it down, switch it off, do something else. You know, if I was a foot, I, I, I I've got to be honest, Paul, and, and say I will never understand why any footballer or manager is is on it because yeah. you I, I I just don't understand it. And if people say, well, I guess it's a way they can interact with fans. Come and see me at the stadium. I'll sign autographs and and you know I'll speak to fans as many as you want, you know, and, and that's when you interact with fans and you do the charity events and the, the fans events for the club and things like that. That's when you interact with fans. If it's going to cause problems, but if you can handle it, then, then I suppose fine. If you can take the fact that one week you might be a hero, the next week you might be getting dogs abuse, just like you do on a pitch, then then absolutely fine. But I, I certainly wouldn't be bothered with it, no. I don't bother with it now, and I, like I, said, I wouldn't be bothered with it even if I was twenty years younger and able to to know what I was doing. I, I think it. Okay, I, I tell you a story about Twitter. Okay, then we'll come on to some other comments, and, and and I would actually value from someone who is clearly committed to to Twitter, um, like Tom Stevens is. To, if you don't want to come on the show, show us a few messages with what you get out of it. Yeah, why do you enjoy it? Um, so when Alan was chairman and I was director, um, we were at Forest Green. We lost, as we lost at most places that season. And I think it was during his driving back. And I kind of, it's not to say took pity on him. Uh, so I, I, I drove him around to the away games. Yeah, because I was going anyway. And, and we're coming out of Forest Green and we're going to the lift. And the lift's only got two floors, but he wanted to go in the lift. And while we're waiting for the lift, he's, he's going on Twitter. So, Alan, don't go on it. There's no point. You've seen the game. You've seen what's happened. We've lost, right? You're right. You're right. I've got to stop doing it. I'm now, I'm stopping it. It's bad for my health. We go down. This is a true story. We go down two flights of stairs. So we're in the lift for about 12 seconds. Bing. Walk out of the lift. It's straight on it. Come to me more than 30 seconds and I couldn't get him off it. I said, get off it. And no, no, I just I just need to see this. And then he starts replying. You know, this is like about our 14th consecutive defeat, right? And I've put I've put my money into this club. How dare you say that? I've I've sanctioned eight signings three weeks ago. 
was just an, all the way home in the car he sat in front of his phone i said, I said alan you've got a problem here do you know what i mean don't worry about what's saying on twitter worry about the football club dropping out of football league and he then admitted to me he didn't quite break down he said to me it's an addiction don't drink much don't smoke he said it's it's my addiction and you couldn't help in those moments but feel sorry for him and and the number of times he was going to come off it kept going back on it and it was the worst possible thing for him now clearly i'd argue he is being stupid by going on it but the vitriol and the abuse that's aimed at him largely and this will be one of my big bugbears with you tom until we know your surname tonight is these people are anonymous now if a person wants to come into a pub sit down with alan and say right you've destroyed my club and do an instructive way alan would be the sort that would actually talk to him he would actually talk to him but to do it in such an adversarial way, I think um, I think it's really poor on all sides. I've not seen what Zach Brunt's dad, yeah, has said about the club. I'm not I'm not bothered. But whatever he said, that doesn't necessarily excuse all the vitriol and bile that gets gets lobbed this way. And in answer to one of the questions on here about the players do communicate, yes, they do, Gary but in a very, very, very structured way. And we often talk about footballers not engaging with the public. Well, you can see why in that kind of arena. Because there'll always be, not just one idiot, not just 10 idiots, but 50 idiots who will anonymously pile in. Uh, and, and I do think Twitter is becoming an increasingly, increasingly toxic um toxic environment that i think footballers are, 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 are best of out of because it's a stressful enough occupation and career and i'd like to do a proper show on this with a player from the club with someone who let's say is quite animated on twitter and debate this and understand the rationale you know, the Atkins says, whatever I post on Twitter, Tom is one of the first to shoot me down, but I like him. We have never argued as such and have good debates, even though he's totally wrong. Only joking. Uh, Tom, Lee Atkins, best way, mate. We always keep it respectful and no name callings. Would happily share a pint. Look at the engagement between two people on this forum there compared to on Twitter. Because with all due respect, Tom, when you are on Twitter, there's a fair bit of abuse flying both ways. And by abuse, I mean highly critical, done in a highly aggressive, I would say, I would say disrespectful. You may argue it's different. You may argue it's different. Tom says, I have many friends down Madeleine who know me. To be fair, if I wanted to remain private, that is my choice. Yeah. Lol, at a push, I will understand you may not meant how it come across to me and many others. I think we're getting to the other. It's like flipping. Where's Henry Kissinger? Right. Uh, Chris Jordan, the anonymity is the key problem. The pub analogy is spot on. And interestingly, Tom and who's the other one? Lee were talking about having a, uh, having a pint. And that, I think, is the difference. That, I think, is the difference. Um, we've bloody rambled on about social media. Um, Stel, um, let's, let's get a bit of um, uh, incisive uh, analytical assessment of Notts County going in the playoffs. And as I couldn't get anyone else, I'm asking you. I was going to say, yeah. Yeah. Right, you've got a special guest coming on. <laughs> Come on. Um, how, okay. how big a concern you is it that we will have to play one away game before a neutral venue because a lot of people say we've got to play two away games we haven't we got all things being equal one home one away one neutral yeah how how concerned are you by that because that's where the achilles heel has been this season isn't it yeah yeah, um, how concerned? Well, it's it's not ideal. 
Absolutely. That's why we were banging on all season about finishing top three. And then, important, we finished fourth and fifth. Well, we've got fifth. Um, it's not ideal. But, like I've said all throughout the season, Notts can beat anybody, home or away, if they perform. You know, there is not a team in the playoffs that they need to fear. Likewise, there is not a team in the playoffs that I think we're massive favourites and we can't get beat by them. And I don't know if it's incisive, I don't even know whether it's analytical, but I'll give you a stat that is certainly better than the points per minute thing you came up with what seemed like a lifetime ago. Um, of, of the six teams, of the six teams who outside of Knotts who could be in the playoffs, right? So obviously Stockport, Wrexham, uh, Solihull, Halifax, Chesey, and Grimsby, what's our record against them? Do you know? Not individually, as a collective. 12 games, six teams played home and away, 12 games, I'll tell you. Won four, drawn four, lost four. Absolutely split that, if you like. What does that tell you about the playoffs? It tells you it's all down to what happens in the 90 minutes against Grimsby, assuming it's Grimsby, then the 90 minutes against... Wrexham or Stockport, and then the 90 minutes at West Ham. That's what it's all about. The past gives you some sort of indicator. We've won four, drawn four, lost four against them teams at the top. Anything can happen on any given day. And as much as we want to pontificate about it and predict this, that and the other, anything can happen. And again, we're back to that lottery thing. It's not a lottery. I agree with you. It's not a lottery. But... A lot of it comes down to where a season is about 44 games. This is down to 90 minutes. Three sets of 90 minutes. And Knotts can get the glory at the end of it. Follow that, Trevor. And don't just say, I agree wholeheartedly. <laughs> <laughs> Trevor, I haven't checked that. Stat. It might be wrong. I'm, 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 all, I'm all stratted out. Um, well, I mean, you, you've got to look at Grimsby. I mean, we, we did Grimsby at their place in the pretty much the last minute. Uh, and they, I'm right, I think I'm right in saying we've only lost twice at home in the league. And Grimsby were one of those teams that beat us. Yeah, last minute. So you just, there's just no telling. Um, I, was, I was talking to a friend of mine the, the other day before the Dover game, I think it was. And he has a recurring nightmare that we're going to get to the final and get beaten by Solihull Moors. So, um, but um, to, to be honest, I, I, I would actually quite like that as a final. So um, I'd, I'd like us to play Solihull Moors in the final. And if, if for whatever reason, Knotts can't get up, whether they, got, whether they get beaten by Grimsby or whoever it is, I should quite like to see Solly Moores do it if we can't. But obviously, you know, we want lots to uh, prevail. OK, I won't duck it because someone did ask what were all the views, which is why I'm asking it as the closing question about, about playoffs. Um, I think we have the tools okay, to win the playoffs. I worry sometimes that we're kind of... Notts County is not a statistical experiment, okay, based on how far we run, high intensity runs, this, that, and the other. Martin O'Neill, good friend of mine, one of his favorite sayings find a way to win. Your free flowing football might not be working, the set piece you've got might not be working, you might be under the cosh. Keep, keep it nil, keep it nil, find a way to win. And talking with Kyle, I know you, you, you mustn't play with, and you can bear this out, Stel, you mustn't play with too much emotion. But sometimes when you look at teams that get results away from home, the number of last-ditch tackles, blocks, things that come flying in, and you need a bit of that. You need a bit of that. And I just think if we can align a little bit it's not passion, but just a little bit more than I think we can get past any away challenge that we may face. Uh, yeah, absolutely. 
you talk about last ditch tackles and, and passion and all that sort of thing. That takes me back immediately to not at Dagenham, Dagenham and Redbridge. That, that one down there, but it was a bit of that. Conor McConnell rolling some, making two or three unbelievable blocks. Last last ditch, we were under the cosh for a, a decent amount of the game, but but they saw it through. They've got, I think they've got a great spirit in that dressing room yep. from everything that radiates out from it. From when you hear them speak, you know, I think they've got a great dressing room. They've got some really good players. And at this level, they have got more than a fighting chance in them playoffs. More than a fighting chance. But like in any playoffs, in any league, you look at the teams involved and you could argue a reasonable case for any team mm -hmm. on any of the given nights, the three nights maximum, that it will take you to have a bit of luck, be magnificent, or, you know, battle and scrap and find a way. That's what you've got to do for three nights, three games, and that's it. And then you're up. And unfortunately, five out of six teams won't be getting that, but one will. And somebody's got to get promoted, so why won't it be not? Ask questions, Stel, because you're doing overtime tonight. And, and they're not very good. They're not very good basic rates for the Magpie Circle podcast, let alone overtime rates. <laughs> Take you back. Playoff final. Against Notts County. For Bradford. I know I don't want to be rhyming on it. Bradford clearly turned up, not Stim. Okay. So you were a player in that Bradford side. Night before, week leading up to the game, are you nervous? Does the manager say, don't play the occasion, do what I tell you? Do you get a Churchillian speech? Yeah. Well, at what, where's your mind as a player before a playoff game? We had Chris Kamara as manager. We did not get a Churchillian speech, I'll tell you that kind of thing. Um, it's, I mean, it's a long time ago. I don't, I don't remember. I don't remember being, particularly being, I remember being excited. I, I don't remember being nervous. Um, but I suppose there must have been nerves, you know, excited nerves that you get for any sort of game. Um, but it, it's 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 a chance for promotion. It was it was as far as I can remember and. Again, this is, you know, 20-odd 20 years, 25, 26 years 20, on. 25, 26 years ago. Yeah. Um, it was, you know, it's a chance to do something. That's what, you, that's what football's all about. You know, it's what your career is all about. It's not to, to, to roll through your career, you know, just, oh, well, it was all right. I got paid and, and that was all right. I paid some bills. And, you know, it was a chance to do something, to achieve something, to play at a great stadium. You know, play in front of a big crowd. It's the games that you want. It's, you know, it's, it, honestly, when people talk about nerves, yes, you have to control nervous excitement and all that sort of thing. Because if you, you know, they like to say about going out on stage, isn't it? If you're not, you're not nervous, you're not in the right frame of mind for it. Um, it's just a great chance to do something in the playoffs. I say, I had a, whatever, how many years? Though, 17, 18 year career, whatever I had. And I got in the playoffs, realistically, when I was playing for teams, twice. So it's not something that comes around every week or every year. You know, it's something that should be cherished, made the most of, enjoyed, because you never know when you're going to get it again. Not to, not to have been in it, not three years now, you know, but maybe that's saying something because of the level or what have you. But, but they, want to, they want to achieve something. These players want to achieve something. Like you said to Carl Woodson, there's a chance to make yourself, make yourself a real name of being a legend for the club, as being part of the team that got back into the Football League and we can consign that three seasons into the history books and hopefully into the bin and we'll never speak about it again and onwards and upwards. So it's a chance to, to really rubber stamp your career, go and make a, a real highlight reel for yourself. You know, it's, it's honestly, it's opportunity. It's, again, whether you look at it glass or full glass, uh, off empty kind of scenario. Some people might look at it as all fear factor. What if? What if? I think the modern game particularly has changed, but you've got to change. You've got to take the fear factor away. Fight fact: five out of the six teams in the playoffs won't get promoted. Fact: none of us know who that will be. One will. Fact: even if all six teams bottle it, one will still get promoted eventually. Even if it's 2019 on penalties because nobody can hit a barn door or anything. So. Why not go and seize it? Why not go and want to be one of them people, one of them winning team?
go and be the skipper if you're Kyle Cameron or maybe Carl Wooten or whoever's on the day. But but go and be. I, I wanted to be the striker that scored the winning goal. I wanted to be a hero. Who doesn't? What little boy doesn't grow up wanting to be a bit of a hero when when they grow up? Everybody does. You don't dream as a little young lad going. Oh, I hope I'm not too nervous when it comes round. I hope it's, I'm not too. You know, nerves are all part of it. But it's responding and and grasping it and grabbing it. It's a great opportunity that you never know when it will come round again. So go and grab it with two hands. Not so got the tools. They've got the players. You know, the other teams are going to be good. It's going to be tough. But go and grab it. Go and make a name for yourself. Brilliant, Snell. Forget I BBC. Thought, Forget I BBC. I forgot what the question was, though. No, 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 no. Room at the London Stadium at two thirty and <laughs> give it some. Give it some. Well, like you, should, you, you should give the team talk based on that. <laughs> like so, we had Cammy. It wasn't quite like that, I don't think. Yeah. Uh, but he got the but he got the job done. It was a great day. I like to say it was a great day, great moment. Terrible game, terrible game, as I remember it. But it doesn't matter. We won. I don't imagine many of the Knots players. I mean, from that day, will remember it with any sort of memories at all because you lose. It's not about losing. Sport is all about winning. Nail on the head. Winners and losers. Um, uh, Chris Jordan. Turns out it's Stell with the Chichilian speech. Lee uh, <laughs> yeah. ends off to work. Uh, thanks for the chat. Um, do, do, do. Uh, everyone's now saying, Ian Bergen get Stell in the changing room. David Skinner, he should give him the team talk. Andrew Blatherwick, Stell for Prime Minister. <laughs> it, could vacancy. it could be a vacancy, oh, okay. depending on your colour. For like the prime minister or leader of the opposition or deputy leader of the opposition. He's hoping I like a beer, but I don't like as much as them. I don't think <laughs> you're all right now. You can drink as much as you want. It was just, it was just eighteen months ago. It was a ready problem. Uh, oh, Trevor, dear. follow that. Closing remarks from you, sir. How can how can you follow that? I feel I feel ten foot tall, which if anyone knows, I'm only about five three. That saves uh, something. Uh, big. Have you grown a couple of inches since I last seen you? You got the key. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming this is a family show, Paul, so I won't say what I'd like. <clears throat> I'll catch you later. Okay. Five foot three in your Cuban yeah, heels. Listen, this is this is this is, this is why where? DKE is one of my favourite players. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Gentlemen, ladies, uh, we've gone on a bit, nearly at the 90 minutes. Uh thank you to everyone uh tonight. Hopefully we're all happy. Hopefully we're all happy. Um, be even happier if Grimsby don't win tomorrow, then that means whatever happens on Sunday, it's a day out and it's a guaranteed home game. A few points that have been raised. All the playoff games are on BT live. OK, I'm sure we'll have plenty of debates about how many tickets we should give Grimsby. Uh, we don't want to count our chickens, but if we're going to wreck them, I'm sure we'll want a big allocation at Wrexham. So for me, it's a it's a little bit. You know, six of one, half a dozen of the other. Um, safe journey down for everyone that's going to Maidenhead who's got a ticket. You'll be there, Stel? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Very good. Um, and we all hope to reconvene. Um, actually, it's, too, it, it's still actually going to be two and a half weeks to the playoff game, isn't it? Mm, two yeah. and a half weeks to a playoff game. Yeah. And, and again... <laughs> Not not to extend this even longer, Paul. But <laughs> don't forget, Wrexham have got the FA Trophy the, the weekend after the last weekend of the season, which yes. is why there's ten days to the uh, the well the, the quarterfinals we want to call it the eliminator, whatever they want to call it for not playing, and then it's that following weekend, the semi final that Wrexham may or may not be playing in, uh, depending on where they finish in the league. So, yes, it's and that's why I go with a strong team Sunday because you haven't. You know, you've not got a game potentially for the next 10 days. Um, so, yeah, keep that momentum going. And, and, and just one final point. Um, I, I would normally never presume to tell Mr. Birchinall uh, who we should go into the loan market for. However, uh, Connor Parsons has just completed his loan spell at Bromley. Uh, and given that he uh, <laughs> of the points per minute formula for any player this season with 2.33, I wonder if we can get him back on loan for the playoffs. No points in the playoffs. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Glad we're all happy families again. Uh, look forward to seeing you again next week after Maidenhead. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you, Stel. Cheers. 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 Bye -bye.